Yeah, I I feel my um, my talk is uh, actually building on Martine Duran's uh, talk, but it's. Um, Could you speak a little bit more into the mic? I... Yes. The microphone could be closer to me, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so uh, what I want to focus on is the question of are the poor less well or do they feel less well? And in typical well-being research, when we ask people how satisfied they are with their lives, the differences in well-being between the poor and the wealthy are minimal, at least the differences as captured by many subjective measures we currently use. Perhaps with exception of what Jeff calls absolute poverty, so in the slums uh, of Kolkata, uh, researchers have consistently found that poverty or structural precarity does not predict reported well-being, subjective well-being. So I want to suggest in this talk that even if the reported levels of well-being on some measures are similar, there are different realities hidden behind such numbers. And I want to highlight that even if people successfully cope with structural precar precarity or poverty, the poor are much more susceptible to being cut off from material and social support in crises. And this, in fact, does harm their well being and even physical uh, fitness as they experience. So, a group of my colleagues at the University of Leuven, my university, um, studied how in the third lockdown, which was uh, this spring in 2021, four groups known to experience structural precarity in Belgium and who are invisible um, were affected by, by the pandemic and the lockdown. Um, and those um, four groups were really chosen to be somewhat invisible, two groups of newcomers, Iraqi refugees, many of whom do not have a legal status, um, and Romanian laborers who um, suffer from socioeconomic precarity. They have temporary low-paying jobs with no protection. And then two groups that are more established in Belgium but uh, are uh, still very vulnerable, a Congolese community in Belgium, a, a racial minority, um, and a group of single moms. And these are actually were pretty big groups varying from uh, 200, over 200 to 600 people. Now, uh, not surprisingly, and this is also what um, what uh, my colleague uh, Martine Durant just uh, told, um, all of those groups were hit hard by the pandemic. They experienced deteriorations in their housing situation, their job or their income, or a combination of those. In general, I would say the participants hardest, uh, hardest hit by the pandemics were the ones who lacked educational qualifications, were unemployed, or didn't, didn't own a home, or did not have Belgian citizenship prior to the pandemic. And, um, and of the group, um, the Iraqi refugees were hardest hit. A third of them reported more precarious income, work, and housing. So one lesson to be drawn from this is that structural precarity makes you more likely to suffer incidental precarity uh, during crisis. But another lesson is particularly interesting for well-being. While structural precarity doesn't predict well-being, um, incidental precarity does. So you can say that people manage to cope with, with constant stressors, maybe uh, unless they, uh, they, they become, you know, they, they touch your, your absolute needs. Um, but um, they didn't, um, they didn't uh, manage to cope in the same way with deterioration. And in fact, those who reported a downturn in all of the domains, job, income, and housing, were the ones that were most at risk of incurring a decrease in well-being and substantial decrease. And the patterns of, of physical fitness as self-reported were similar to those in well-being. So one conclusion is that structural poverty puts you at risk in crisis. People do not have the resources to cope with additional stressors. And this is even true for a relatively egalitarian country um, like uh, Belgium. There's something to say about the 
egalitarianism of Belgium also, but I will refrain from that. So while it may be true that people are resilient or, or become used or, or don't feel they're entitled to more, um, to many of the enduring conditions of deprivation, additional deprivations do affect well-being and physical fitness. Um, I'm just checking how I'm doing on time. A couple more minutes. One, yep. one minute, okay. So in this crisis, there was more at stake than just material deterioration. There was also deterioration in social supports. The social fabric came apart. And this is probably also pretty typical for crises like war and you know, displacement. Um, for example, about 50% of those four samples um, reported that they received less report from uh, less support from close and distant others than before outside of the family. Um, and for the newcomers uh, group particularly, this often meant that they lost the support of white Belgians, which in turn gave them less access to formal social arrangements such as healthcare. So a stunning number, uh, like 10% of the Romanian uh, migrants reported um, that they hadn't that they had been denied essential medical care, for example, and this was related to uh, to having a, a decrease in the informal social network. Um, the pre-report of this is, you know, the data are very recent. The pre-report of this is just out, so I have no data about the relationship between loss of support uh, and well-being. But here too, as an emotion research, I would predict that loss of support comes with um, reduced well-being. So I think it's a, it's another way of looking at well-being is is how vulnerable or precarious your well-being is in the face of. of um, of crisis of, of additional stressors. Um, okay, so so one thing, and I, I think I'm not, I'm no exception thinking that, but poverty is not just resource poverty, of course, it's also social support um, poverty, and that in, importantly um, uh, feeds into the kind of resource, po resource poverty that you have. I wanna leave it at that. Very good.